Jason Miller uh, back to deliver a lecture. He, he delivered a lecture uh, last year on the intellectual foundations of the new evangelization. He primarily looked at the thought of uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, the Great. Um, yes, the Great. And uh, anyway, I told him tonight I was going to introduce him in a more uh, informal manner instead of going through all of his degrees and wonderful accomplishments, which are many, for sure. Uh, he is a, a graduate of Franciscan University, like myself, uh, one of the best universities in the United States, so that always makes me happy. He's also a prisoner here at Sacred Heart Parish, and he directs P uh, Poverty, Inc., uh, or the Poverty Cure, uh, through the Acton Institute. And really, he's one of the most genuine people I know. And it never is there a moment when I talk with Michael where I feel that he leaves me out in left field. He's certainly much more brilliant than I am, but he's a real gentleman. And he's passionate about the faith, and he's passionate about the truth. Uh, this evening, he's going to bless us uh, with his lecture, which is on poverty, charity, and justice, and the Christian obligation to serve the poor. So... It's a great blessing. Let's give uh, Mr. Michael Miller a nice round of applause, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Michael just reminded me that Father's going to open us with a prayer. And, and, then, and then Father will introduce Mike. This is why Mark has me close. Okay. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the beauty of life, for the gift of your creation, and most especially for the gift of your only begotten Son. We ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that we might be built up as your sons and daughters, that our ears might be open to hear your word, and our hearts might be strengthened to serve all your sons and daughters. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, grateful also to Mark Postma and uh, Sacred Heart Church and the Authentic Malda people uh, for inviting me again. Last year I did uh, more of a philosophical theological talk. This year is going to be a mix of philosophy and theology with some uh, discussion about poverty and economics as well. Um, Father Aaron prayed, but if you don't mind, I always like to pray too, so maybe you can join with me. Uh, o oh Lord and Master of my life, cast your light into the darkness of our hearts. Give us right faith, firm hope, perfect charity with wisdom and perception that we might do what is truly your holy will. Amen. So concern for the poor is at the heart of Christianity. The Holy Father Pope Francis has spoken of this often. It has been one of the great themes of his pontificate, St. John Paul. Two spoke about poverty as one of the great moral challenges of our time. So care for the poor, for Christians, is not an option. It's not something you can choose to do, right? And so in this world kind of, of, of choice and of social justice, we can tend to say, well, you know, I'm into liturgy and moral theology and those people are into social justice or you know I, I don't really care. and this is really not an option because care for the poor is right at the center of what we are called to do saint james uh, in his epistle i like speaking to catholics because i get to say saint james instead of just james in his epistle um summarizes the gospel message quite powerfully he says pure religion is this to care for the widow and the orphan in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So we are called to be in the world, but not of it. And I think it's important that he, he notice this. What's pure religion? Oftentimes, oh, pure religion is to care for the widow and the orphan in their distress. True. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. And this goes back to that point that it's not one or the other. We are to keep one, ourselves unstained from the world and to care for the widow and the orphan in their distress. And so pure religion is not to focus on one but to focus on both together. Uh, we also know that almsgiving is one of the eminently good works. 
as we enter Lent, right, these, these fa fa prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And to ignore the plight of the poor can have terrible consequences for our eternal souls. As Pope Francis has written in Evangelii Gaudium, he says, almost without being aware of it, quote, we end up being incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor, as though this were someone else's responsibility and not our own. The culture of prosperity deadens us. We are thrilled if the market offers us something new to purchase. In the meantime, all those lives stunted for lack of opportunity seem a mere spectacle. They fail to move us. Now this problem, of course, is nothing new. This is precisely what we see in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Now, usually when I give a talk like this, I have these PowerPoint with, where I have pictures and I have an icon of this. I, in fact, if you, if you like this talk, that's great, but I mean, you should have seen how great it would have been had I had the PowerPoint. I mean, it's, un, it's like unbelievable. But I also work at the Acton Institute, as Mike said, and Lord Acton actually, as you know, is very famous for saying that power tends to corrupt and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely so there's a little bit of a tension in me here to keep myself unstained from PowerPoint okay so but so Lazarus and the rich man you all know the parable oh wait there are Catholics here so you probably haven't read that all right I'm just, I'm just kidding I'm just kidding all right so Saint Augustine when he was commenting on this on this essay says it was not on this essay on this parable Saint Augustine when he was commenting on this parable said it was not wealth that sent the rich man to hell. It was his indifference. He just didn't care. He ignored the poor man. And St. John Chrysostom and others have argued, commenting on this passage, that care for the poor, as I said, what you said, is not an option. It's not only a question of charity. It's also a question of justice. So in one sense, the salvation of the rich man was in front of him. It was Lazarus. And he was indifferent. He just passed him by. So the call, and this is, again, this is not only a violation of charity, it is a violation of justice. So the call for, to care for the poor is absolutely clear. It's essential in our tradition. But it's not simply a call just to do something, okay? We're not simply called to exercise our will on behalf of poor people. We're not called to sentimentality on behalf of the poor. You remember that bumper sticker many years ago that said, practice random acts of kindness? Okay. Well, Christians are not called to random acts of kindness. Christians are called to exercise the virtue of charity, ordained by reason and oriented to the truth. Because Christians recognize that all human beings are created in the image of the divine logos. And so we are to use our reason, and our reason is to inform our engagement with the poor. Our reason is to engage our charity. Benedict XVI writes in Caritas in Veritate, a very powerful line that really in many ways is the theme of this lecture. Only in truth does charity shine forth, he writes. Only in truth can charity be authentically lived. Without truth, charity degenerates into sentimentality. Okay, let me repeat that part. Without truth, charity degenerates into, senten into sentimentality. So this means that our charity... And our desire for justice, our hungering for justice, must be rooted in the virtue of prudence. All right? Now, you all remember the four cardinal virtues, right? Is anybody not sure what they are? It's okay, right? What are they? Prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. And the mother of the virtues is what? Prudence. Prudence is the mother of the virtues. Now, why? All right. So, some of you who are old enough, remember, when we talk about prudence, we imagine, um, what's that actor? Dana Carvey. Remember Dana Carvey doing the imitation of George H.W. Bush? Okay, that's George W.'s father. <laughs> okay. And he'd say, not going to do it. Wouldn't be prudent. Not going to do it. Okay. 
I have never been prudent. I was in the White House for eight years in the 90s. I was not prudent. Okay? I appreciate prudence. <laughs> All right, so you have this, this idea of prudence, right? And we think of prudence as being very careful, but prudence actually is not simply being careful. Prudence defined in the tradition, and Joseph Pieper really uses this, prudence is seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly, right? Seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly. So our justice has to be guided by prudence. Why? It's very simple. If we don't see the world as it is, how can we be just? How can we be brave? How can we have temperance? How can we persevere? Right? So the mother of the virtues is not a boring virtue. The mother of the virtues is our deep engagement with reality. It's taking reality seriously. And remember, Aquinas defines truth as what? The conforming of the mind to reality. Conforming of the intellect to reality. So prudence is really the virtue of engaging reality. So our understanding of charity then is not separated from the cardinal virtues and it's not separated from especially the virtue of prudence. It in fact must be informed by it. Now, the problem is a lot of our work in poverty is in fact guided by sentimentality and not by prudence. And it's understandable, ladies and gentlemen, because when we see a serious problem, when we see deep, intense poverty, a person living on dirt floors and sick and not a lot of nothing, not very much to eat, we are moved and we want to do something, we want to do something right now. The rock star Bob Geldof, who some of you know has been a big advocate for kind of raising awareness in poverty, he said, we need to do something even if it doesn't work. Okay, now his passion is admirable, but notice the problem, right? He's assuming that the something he does is either going to be positive or neutral, when in fact the something that he does could in fact make the situation worse. He might harm the people he's trying to help. So I found this wonderful quote from St. Thomas not too long ago. It's an opening of one of the Pieper chapters. How many of you read Joseph Pieper? Okay. Those of you who do, you know he's awesome. Those of you who don't, trust me, he's awesome. You should read Joseph Pieper. Um, I have a reading list on my website. You can find some of the books there. He's brilliant. Um, and some of his books are really little, so you actually feel like you accomplished something. <laughs> okay, Abuse of language, abuse of power is about that big. I highly recommend it. All right. So I found this quote by Taquinas. And he says this. Justice can be destroyed in two ways. By the violent act of the man who possesses power. We get that, right? Justice is destroyed by the bad guy with power who just crushes you. And the second way... <clears throat> pardon me, is by the false prudence of the sage. Justice can be destroyed in two ways, by the violent act of the man who possesses power and by the false prudence of the sage. That is, imprudent charity can actually create injustice. The social engineers who have set out to eradicate poverty in their imprudence have actually created injustice. Because we must have a heart for the poor, ladies and gentlemen. We are called by God to have a heart for the poor. But having a heart for the poor is not enough. We are also called to have a mind for the poor. We must not just exercise our will sentimentally in the face of difficulty, but actually engage with human beings. And I'll talk about that part in more detail. So what I'd like to do in this lecture is consider three things. One, I'm going to examine pretty briefly, this is a big topic, and I'll just give you a couple examples, of the dominant approach to charity and social justice, and how it has not been as successful as was hoped. And again, despite benevolent will on many of the people involved, has actually done harm. Second, 
I will discuss some of the underlying theological and philosophical problems with this current model. And then finally, I will argue that the biggest obstacle for today's poor is not that they lack material goods, but that they are excluded. We often hear this, this theme from religious reader, leaders and others, that poor people are somehow dominated by markets and people are, are, are crushed. But the reality is poor people are excluded from markets. Poor people are locked out. They lack the institutions of justice that would enable them to create prosperity in their own families and their own communities. And that unfortunately, a lot of the poverty work, a lot of the poverty industry, as I call it, makes this situation worse. And instead of helping, further excludes the poor, as I'll give you some examples. Okay, so that's the outline of, of the talk. And so let me start first by kind of giving a historical breakthrough and then a breakdown and then a couple of the examples of the dominant way in which we have attempted to help the poor. Okay, so at the end of World War II and the breakup of colonialism, the dominant idea at the time was if you could just deploy large transfers of money from the governments of the developed economies in the West and send it to developing economies in, 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 in say, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, we could build up infrastructure, electricity, education, and we could jumpstart the process of economic development and countries could make the leap into industrialism. Now, these ideas came out of the context of World War II, the idea that we've won the war, now let's win the peace, okay? And the intellectual fashion at the time was of social engineering, right, and large-scale industrial plans. And this was across uh, the, the, the world. It wasn't only the Soviet Union who had five-year industrial plans. Um, the West did as well. However, as time has passed, and if we look at it from a longer perspective, the success of this, this model comes into question. And I would argue that what's happened is over time, an entire poverty industry has emerged. And like other industries, the goal of the poverty industry is to stay in business. Now again, I'm going to make some critiques, and I think it's really important. I am not attacking the intentions or the benevolence or the heart of the people involved. 99% of people who go into work to help the poor go in with a good heart. Okay, I just gave a, a talk at United States Aid, right, which is the, the government aid agency, right? And, and, and I'm, we're crit I'm critical of it, right? But these people sitting at the table were also, you know, they're not bad people. And it's very important that we make a distinction that, they're, that most people who are involved, even if I'm critiquing them, it's not their heart, right? It's not their, it's not their desire to abuse others and make money off yeah. of them. But nevertheless, that does happen. And then you can talk to people and they kind of express how the difficulties and the challenges, okay? But I think it's important to set that out because I don't want this to seem like an ad hominem attack that somehow there are bad guys who are trying to make the situation worse, right? Of course, there are always bad guys in every industry, but the majority of people who help work to in, in, in poverty have a good heart, all right? So there's lots of, this, is a, this poverty industry is actually quite complex. There's lots of players, lots of overlapping incentives, and I'm not gonna go into all of them. But I'll talk about a couple of them. The first thing I'd like to talk about is large-scale foreign aid. The second I'll talk about are what are called non-governmental organizations. And the third, private charity, often Christian charity. All right, so let's talk about foreign aid. Now, the foreign aid idea is what I've kind of explained, that we're gonna take large, amounts of money from governments in the West and give it to governments in the developing world to jumpstart the process of development. And now, while there have been some successful aid projects, like for example, uh, early response to an Indian Ocean tsunami that's uh, saved many lives. At the same time, if we look at the overall track record of government to government transfers, that's what I'm talking about foreign aid, government to government transfers, the record is mixed at best. In fact, the National Bureau of Economic Research finds little to no correlation between aid and development. Now, Mike mentioned that I directed a film called Poverty Inc. and I worked on a project called Poverty Cure DVD series. And um, we as a team probably did over 200. I did over, probably close to 150 interviews with people from experts and development experts to business people to one man named Joshua Moga who lives in, in Kibera and in Nairobi who borrowed $8 from a friend to start a shop. And so it was an interesting experience to talk to, to different people and get their insights. 
Senegalese businessman Malik Fall talks about aid this way. He says, aid has delayed the development of business in Africa. It has kept Africa behind. Why? Because when aid is given, it can often replace or crowd out local businesses. Even worse, aid often becomes linked, and by aid I mean government to government transfers. Aid often becomes linked with business and ends up feeding a type of crony capitalism where big business, powerful interest groups, and entrenched political bureaucracy collude with one another for advantages and lock out the poor. A Ghanaian entrepreneur named Herman Chinere Hesse started a little software company down in Ghana. It was called um, Soft Tribe, and he called his software tropically tolerant because you know the electricity is always going out, and he wanted it to be tropically tolerant. Um, well, he got together with five companies to bid for a a um, uh, a government contract uh, in Ghana. And there are five companies, everything was going well, they were about to get the business, and their competitor was a European company who got the European government to make a soft loan to Ghana on the condition that that European company would get the business. Okay, so Herman said, we lost our business. They ended up getting contracted as subcontractors to do some of the work. So he said, their government paid, they took the money, we did the work. That's not aid, that's not assistance, that's thuggery. That's how he described it to me. Well, that's crony capitalism. And that's one of the deepest problems of aid. Let me give you another example. Here's, especially in the realm of agriculture. Now, when you think about like, listen, people are starving, we've gotta help the poor. We've gotta help people who are starving. Let me tell you about some of the ways we help people who are starving. In Europe and the United States, we subsidize our agriculture in order to quote unquote protect farmers. Mostly what we're doing is protecting major agricultural companies in five products. I interviewed a man named Joel Salatin, who's an organic farmer in um, Virginia, and uh, he wrote a book called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. And uh, it's a great book, and he tells the story of, it's actually most of the things that he wants to do as a small, he's a medium-sized farmer, are made illegal by big agriculture companies who lobby the government to set up regulations to, to limit competition. So it's, it's not actually protecting American farmers, but let me tell you what it does to developing world farmers. What we do is we over, so we subsidize our farmers, we put up tariffs, we overproduce, then we ship the food into the developing world, either as aid to help those in need, or we sell it at artificially cheap prices. We force other countries to lower their tariffs, and then we put all this food into those countries and we destroy local farmers. We put them out of business. And then what do we do? We say, oh my goodness, competition really hurts poor people. So we make regulations. And who do you think writes the regulations? Big corporations to actually create a system that is even more exclusionary to poor people. So what we have is this deep managerial bureaucratic crony capitalism, an oligarchy that favors the powerful and the connected. The Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom reported that out of one billion dollars in agricultural food aid, 70 percent went to three companies. That's 700 million dollars. What we have is taxpayers are subsidizing big corporations in the name of helping the poor. Now, why am I talking about all these economic things? Because there's a question of justice inside. There's a question of how, what does it mean to care for the widow and the orphan in their distress? Now, foreign aid can, as I said, be helpful and necessary in emergencies. The problem is we have used the emergency model as the model for economic development. So I talked to one man in Haiti three years after the earthquake. This is in 2015. Uh, they said they're still giving away free rides. Three years after the earthquake, they're given a free race. And so farmers ended up losing their jobs and moving into cities, right? So in some ways, foreign aid has become a new type of colonialism. One man, he's an American who worked in Haiti, put it this way. He was talking to this Haitian guy, and the Haitian guy said, well, first we had colonialism. Then we had neo-colonialism. Then we have neo-neo-colonialism. And now we just have development, development which is a new type of colonialism. Now, 
This colonialism is deeply problematic on many levels. I think it's problematic because it excludes poor people. But there's one thing I'd like to do before I move on. I don't want to spend any more time on aid. I want to talk about other organizations because it's deeply important to realize. Some people say, are you a critic of foreign aid? And my answer is partially. Why I say partially? Because foreign aid is actually a symptom of a, broke, of a deeper broken system of humanitarianism. Foreign aid is the big 500 pound gorilla in the room because of the billions of dollars that are sent over. But really it's just one symptom of a larger problem of humanitarianism that unfortunately Catholic organizations are part of as well. And I'm gonna talk about that in detail. But I wanna say that because I'm not simply just like going after foreign aid and somehow that's the problem. All right, but let me, but, but I do wanna address one important moral issue with, with, with aid. Often, as you may know, aid grants or, loan, or loans are made contingent upon morally evil things. Maybe you don't know this, but most notably this is population control programs, okay? And most recently, um, questions of, of like re redefinition of marriage, right? Population programs and redefinition of marriage. But I'd like to focus on population programs right now because this has been going on for decades. Western nations and international organizations often impose a Western secular enlightenment reductionist worldview on developing nations. And they make this contingent upon receiving money. The United Nations Millennium Development Goals, they have new ones now, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, but the Millennium Development Goals number four, the goals were to eradicate extreme poverty by 2015. Okay, And number four said, improve maternal health. Now this includes abortion. And sadly, some Catholic groups have signed on to these, like the University of Notre Dame, where I went to undergraduate school, right? And the University of Notre Dame is a wonderful place to become a Protestant. So <clears throat> I highly recommend it. All right. Um, and so people are signing on to these, right? And then there's, this, there's also these debates about whether you can use government money to fund abortions right, in the developing world. Over the last decade, Western governments and international organizations have spent literally billions of dollars promoting population control programs throughout the world. Now, for young people in the, in the audience, I just said literally billions of dollars. I mean literally billions of dollars okay young people like to say that guy came up to me and he literally ripped my arm off i mean my arm right here it's gone my arm is literally ripped off it's like outside it's literally outside no no it's figuratively ripped off okay all right so just so that's a translation right all the people over a certain age are like why is he doing that all the young people are like dude i didn't know literally meant figuratively okay so it's literally and figuratively. I, I want to start using figuratively real, like, I am figuratively here right now. Okay? All right. So, now, billions of dollars, despite no evidence that population, can causes, that population causes poverty. People are not a burden. In fact, when given opportunity, people are in fact the solution to the problems that face us. But here's what happens. Population control is based on, th on well, three things, okay? It's based on a fallacy of, in three fallacies, a fallacy of intuition, okay? It's based on a fallacy of, of economics, and it's based on an anthropological fallacy. And this is very important for us, because we, the de like John Paul II had this line, it's, it's important, he says, the primary fault of socialism was anthropological in nature. If you get the person wrong, you get everything else wrong. Well, the primary fault of social engineering and neocolonialism is anthropological in nature. In fact, I would argue that the primary fault, which I'll talk about in detail, of the way we deal with poor people and with poverty is anthropological in nature. But here's what happens with population control. It's based on three things. The first is an intuition. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can remember this. All right, here we go. 
a baseball and a baseball bat together cost a dollar and ten cents. You with me? Okay. The baseball bat costs a dollar. How much does the ball cost? Okay, ten cents. All right. The answer is not ten cents. Have you figured it out? Okay, because it's a dollar and ten together. Right, ten cents more. It's actually five cents. All right. So anyway, here's the here's the thing. What happens is we have a fallacy of intuition. We see something and we immediately react to it. In this project, tw I think 74% of Harvard undergraduates got the question wrong. Because we see the problem, we immediately react and we come up with a solution. Okay? So there's one, an, a fallacy of intuition. This is what happens. People go down the developing world and they see lots of poor children. And the poor children are coming up and they're like, can I have shoes, can I have some money, and all these poor children. And there's this immediate reaction like, wow, there are a lot of children here. If there were fewer children, there'd be more stuff to go around. Right? So this is this intuition. You immediately kind of intuit it. And this is fueled by two dominant fallacies, an economic fallacy called the zero-sum game. The zero-sum game sees the economy as a pie. And if you have more, then you have less. And if you have less, then you have more. Right? And it misses the possibility of economic growth. Right. Economic growth can be proved by the fact that some of you have iPhones in your pocket. Okay? The fact that most of us are not farmers right? and that we have electricity. These are some of the evidences of economic growth. So what happens though is we get this, we get this, this idea of the zero-sum game and it becomes insidious when it's applied to human beings. So let me give you an example. Let's say we took, everybody took their money and we pooled our money and we put it right in the middle of the, of the uh, floor here, okay? So everybody's money was here. And then we took half the room and we eradicated half the room, okay? I feel your pain, okay? <laughs> I am with you guys, I'm dead too. Okay, so now you take the money and you divide it up among the remaining people. Are they richer, yes or no? Are they richer? Yes, absolutely. Okay? That's why we need to control population. Because if you have all the money then, and, you, and you have fewer people, then everybody's better off. But what happened? What we did is we destroyed the productive capacity of this side of the room. So it is a snapshot, a, a photograph at a moment based on an economic fallacy that, that, that misses dynamism and misses the potential productivity and capacity of the human person. And so we make lots of bad decisions. The third fallacy is the anthropological fallacy. And that is people can produce, when given the opportunity, much more than they consume. And you know what? It doesn't even matter if they do. And that's the deepest anthropological truth. That human beings are not valuable because they're economic agents. It doesn't matter if poor people produce less than they can because that's not where their dignity and where their value comes from. But when we live in a reductionist, relativist, rationalist world, we turn people into instruments and to objects. But the facts are, Lots of young, lots of people who have been murdered through population control programs were potential mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters. So it doesn't actually matter if they're economically viable. It matters that they have dignity. So there are three deep problems. The fallacy of intuition, the fallacy of economics, of the zero-sum game, and the fallacy of anthropology. Now, population control has not eradicated poverty. But I didn't say it didn't work. I didn't say population control did not work. It has worked. It's worked actually quite profoundly. When you encourage families to have fewer numbers of children and you put billions of dollars, remember literally billions, billions of dollars into these projects, 
they do have fewer children. And what kind of child do you think they choose? Boys, absolutely right, they choose boys. So we have what The Economist magazine has called gender side. What happened to 100 million missing baby girls? That's just one place. The New York Times has called it the daughter deficit. We have eradicated hundreds of millions of baby girls based on bad economics, bad intuition, and bad anthropology. Now this shortage of girls is only the beginning. It's not just China too, it's all over. And it's going to do a lot of negative things. I sometimes think maybe I'm too hardcore when I say this, but you know how God said it's not good for man to be alone? Okay. You know what happens when men are alone? They fight. You know what happens if you have millions of men who are alone? That's called a big war. But there's another problem too that's deeply, they're very serious, and that's this. When there are fewer girls, girls do not get valued. They get commoditized. And so we're already seeing the rise in human trafficking. Right? Because we've got to do something, even if it doesn't work. Sometimes the things we do can have negative impacts. All right. So let me move on um, quickly that, to, to non-governmental organizations and, and, and charities, and then I will go back to the deeper philosophical and theological problems. I think it's important to realize that it's not just kind of big, big government that is the problem with this, these big government transfers, right? Um, a lot of them are problems are what are called non-governmental organizations or NGOs. Now we tend to think of NGOs as private nonprofit organizations with altruistic mo motives, and many of them are. But many NGOs, especially some of the large international ones, get huge amounts of funding from governments and international agencies. So in many ways, they're not really private organizations. They are para-state organizations. They are government-financed private organizations. They are arms of the state. I talked to Herman Chinnery Hesse, that Ghanaian entrepreneur I told you about. He said, you get the World Bank and the IMF and the United Nations pushing policy this way, right? And then you have the grassroots NGOs pushing policy this way. But it's not grassroots. It's AstroTurf because they're being funded by these very big organizations, right? So it's not this kind of private simple. Now, there are small ones, but let me give you some examples. Um, Catholic Relief Services here in the United States, according to its own reporting, gets over 70% of its budget from government money. So you have to ask yourself, is Catholic Relief Services an arm of the church or an arm of the state? Now, it's not intrinsically wrong to take money from the government. Good people can disagree on that. But I would ask whether it's prudent or not, whether it's seeing the world as it is and acting accordingly. Because when you make a deal with the devil, you are always the junior partner, right? So the other thing with NGOs is just like foreign aid, they can crowd out local entrepreneurs. So when my colleagues and I were in Haiti, we, we went to a solar panel factory in Haiti. How many people knew they made solar panels in Haiti? Right? Very few, right? Because we imagine Haitians with the bowl of rice, right? Can you help me? So these guys are there making solar panels. And they hire men, because it's a big, it's a manufacturing plant, from these, some of the poorest places in, in the world. One place specifically called City Soleil was ranked by the United Nations, I think it was the year 2006 or so, so it was a while ago, as the most dangerous place on the planet. And these guys in Haiti and Port-au-Prince hire men from these neighborhoods to work in these projects. Now, when, before the earthquake, they were selling 50 streetlights a month. They make solar panel streetlights with, with um, you know, pull, poles there and a phone charger and everything. And they were selling 50 streetlights a month before the earthquake. After the earthquake, you can imagine demand went rocket high for solar light because of all the problems with electricity. They sold five street lights in six months. From 50 a month to five in six months. I said, what happened? You can't compete with free stuff. All the NGOs came down, gave free stuff, and almost destroyed their business. I said, did you talk to those guys? He goes, of course, we met them many times. 
So it wasn't like they didn't know. The question also is, this is not just the livelihood of the two entrepreneurs who started it. It's the livelihood of all those men in those poor neighborhoods who are trying to raise their children. Right? And so sometimes our good private help disemploys, if that's a word, fathers. So is our charity just and prudent? Let me give you an example of charity. It's not just, it's not just NGOs. It's also Christian charity. Um, a friend of mine uh, who is now, who is the um, president of Hope International, I got to know him over the last couple of years, interviewed him. He told me a story about a church in Atlanta wanted to give eggs to a community in Rwanda after the earthquake, not the earthquake, after the genocide in Rwanda. And so they sent all these eggs over to a community. Well, what they didn't know is there was a man named John in that community who had just bought some hens and was starting an egg business. And when all the eggs came in, they put John out of business. And then the next year, the church said, we've done our good here. Let's move on to the next community. And so what happened is th that community, instead of being able to have a local business providing eggs, actually was hurt by charity. Another example of unintended consequences of caring for the widow and the orphan. I met Shelley and Corrigan Clay, who are an American couple, uh, evangelicals, who went down to Haiti to adopt a child and then to start an orphanage. Well, they were about to adopt the child, and they were working in an orphanage for a year before they started their own. And the director of the orphanage said, would you like to meet the mother? And they were a little shocked, like, oh, I thought he was abandoned. But OK, maybe it was a bad situation. And they said, well, oh, yeah, sure, we're fine with that. And so is she okay with it? He's like, oh no, she comes you know, once every week or two weeks and brings the child gifts and everything. And they watched the mother with the child. It was like, it's obvious that the mother loves this child. And they said, what? Why, are you, why are you giving your child away for an adoption? And she said, I just can't afford the child. And Shelley said, it was like this shock, she said. The injustice of it struck me, here I am, spending $20,000 to adopt a child that the mother wants? Well, they began to talk to their, look at their own orphanage, the way where they were working, and other orphanage directors, and they discovered that about 80% of orphans in Haiti have at least one living parent. Okay, 80% of orphans. And so pa children, parents put their children into orphanages because they can't take care of them or because it's a good opportunity for them. There's a story we tell in the film, Poverty Inc., uh, which is coming to Grand Rapids, by the way, but uh, that one says, are you, you're, about to meet your, you're, about, you're about to meet your new parents. Are you excited? This 14-year-old boy said, they're not my mom and dad. Corrigan said, well, no, I know they're not your mom and dad yet, but they're going to adopt you. You're going to be in their family. He goes, no. My mom and dad are here in Haiti. I know them. They sent me to the orphanage to be the one child who gets the visa, goes out, gets a job, comes back and helps. So our desire to care for the widow and the orphan, because it was imprudent, ended up actually breaking apart families. So Corrigan and Shelley said, okay, we got to do something else. We got to think in the principle of subsidiarity. Why instead, instead of us taking care of children, what if we could help empower parents? And so they started a business. They're crafty people, so they started a craft business. But now they employ over 220 workers, making more than $30,000 a month, and caring for over 700 children. Not them, the parents are caring for over 700 children. And I actually met this one woman who was able to, who was about to give her child up for adoption. She got a job with Shelley and Cor Corrigan and was able to buy a house where her children live. I visited the house. So the question is, how are, like, are we focusing on families? Are we focused on just how are we engaging poor people? All right. So I would say there are two kind of dominant problems with poverty and, and charity. I'm going to move now to part, the second part away from the kind of examples. And I'd like to look at the underlying problems with the dominant model, whether it's Government-to-government -government transfers, private organizations, or Christian charity. 
I would argue that the dominant idea of how we engage with the poor is not charity, but rather humanitarianism. And humanitarianism is a hollowed out secular and materialist vision of Christian love. One that focuses primarily on meeting material needs. So humanitarianism has limited horizons, all right? It stops at providing comfort. It stops at providing food or health care. But it doesn't see the spiritual dimension of the person. It doesn't recognize that persons are not merely material beings, but persons have not only an eternal destiny, but they have a, a spiritual nature set for human flourishing right here and right now. So it's actually kind of interesting because the deepest critique, of, one of the deepest critiques of humanitarianism comes from Nietzsche, who recognizes that it's a last man morality, right? It stops in this boring, limited notion, notion of the human person. And this is really, as I said, it is a hollowed out vision of Christ, version of Christian love. On the outside, it appears the same. Concern for the poor, concern for the downtrodden. But it is a sentimental love. Now it's contrasted, and the way to understand it is the opposite, or this contrast is Christian love, is caritas, agape. Right? And you know that charity which we've talked about as one of the theological virtues, must be guided by, guided by prudence and ordained and oriented to, ordained by reason and oriented to the truth. Charity, caritas, is what? Caritas is to seek the good of the other. It is to will the other person's good, right? Joseph Pieper talks about the intensio benevolentia, the intention, the desire, for the benevolence of the person with whom you are in a relationship. So you're seeking after the good of the other while keeping the eternal destiny of the person in mind. Right, Lewis has that famous line, you have never met a mere mortal. You're not dealing in charity with things, we are dealing with eternal persons. So, as I said, this is where you see this Benedict of this charity separated from truth degenerates into sentimentalism. So too often in our desire to help, we forget the inherent dignity and the creative capacity of the person. We see poverty and we say, what can I do to help? But the better question is, how do people in the developing world in poverty create prosperity for their families and their communities. Now, it sounds like a small shift, but it's extremely important. And it's related to the second philosophical and theological problem with the dominant way we think about charity. And I don't mean the dominant way in which the secular world thinks about charity. I would argue most of the Christian world has adopted humanitarianism as the model. We adopt a bad copy of Christian love. We copy a bad copy of Christian love instead of going deep into our tradition and think about what does it mean to care for the poor? How did the church care for the poor through the ages? Instead, that's too difficult for us, so we look to the United Nations and the World Bank and the United USAID and all these things, so we imitate a broken model. But as I said, this goes to the deeper part. The second philosophical problem is also related to humanitarianism, is that we have turned poor people into the objects of our charity, the objects of our pity, and the objects of our compassion. Instead of seeing people as subjects, I don't mean subjects of the king, I mean subjects, grammar, and I. Right? Max Shaler talks about you're in an I-I relationship. Martin Buber, I-thou relationship. There's two subjects involved. Instead, we treat poor people like the objects of our charity. And, and Fr Pope Francis has said this. We cannot treat poor people merely like objects. They should be the protagonists of their own story 
of development. But what we do is we take this objectified notion and then we combine it with top-down social engineering and technocracy to turn people into problems to be solved and the developing world as a lab for experiments. Now, some of you heard me talk about this a year ago, but since it was a year ago, you're probably not going to remember. Let me give you an analogy of what I mean by treating people like subjects and objects. Okay, so it comes from Genesis. God creates Adam, and he puts Adam into the garden, and Adam names all the animals, okay? And he's unsatisfied, okay? He's unsatisfied. And so God says, it is not good for man to be alone. So he puts Adam into a deep sleep, and from his rib, he creates Eve. And then he puts Eve in front of Adam, and he says, and what does Adam say? Adam says, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, at last. What Cardinal Scola, in the book called The Nuptial Mystery, is a beautiful book, says is he sees identity and difference. Identity and difference. And in that identity and difference is a call to communion. And from that communion comes another subject willed for his or her own sake. That's why when you say a child is a gift, it's not a sentimental statement, it's an ontological reality. Because parent, the, the child is not a choice for the parents. A child is a gift who has his or her own eternal destiny, a subject. Then the fall happens, right? And what does God say? You shall desire your husband and he will lord it over you. Those are brutal words. And so Scola says that the difference comes in front of the identity. And Adam turns Eve into an object for his own gratification. He objectifies a person. And this, of course, is the challenge of our time. Leon Cass, in his wonderful philosophical reading of Genesis, says, what takes place with Adam and Eve isn't just historical. It happens always. It is our condition that we objectify others. And so analogously, and with less gravity, of course, we can turn poor people into the objects of our charity, of our compassion, of our pity. But poor people are not objects. They are subjects. And so this leads me to the last part of my talk, and I'll, I'll go pretty quickly here, and then we'll open up for question and answers. So I'll leave some of this out, but I think just something for you to think about is one of the, th is that the biggest problem for poor people is that they are excluded. They have been objectified and they are excluded. Pope Francis says we must say no to an economy of exclusion and inequality. This echoes John Paul who said, poverty in today's circumstances is primarily a matter of exclusion from networks of productivity and exchange, not simplistically a matter of having unequal or inadequate portion of what is imagined to be a fixed number of economics good, economic goods, end quote. Now, one thing you'll often hear from religious leaders is if North American Christians were more generous, we could raise $84 billion and we could eradicate extreme poverty forever. If we could raise $84 billion, we could eradicate extreme poverty forever. Ladies and gentlemen, no, we couldn't. Because poor people are not poor because they lack stuff, right? It's like a miracle. I'm going to buy my way out of poverty. Give me two hamburgers and end extreme poverty. No, poor people are not poor because they lack stuff. Poor people are poor primarily because they are excluded from the institutions of justice. Now, what, is it, what do I mean by the institutions of justice? I'm going to do this really fast because I don't want to give you too much economics here. Okay, we've already done a little bit with the zero-sum game. All right, but what do I mean by the institutions of justice? Well, Hernando de Soto, who's a Peruvian economist, says the developing world is teeming with, poor, uh, with, teeming with entrepreneurs. 
right? There's all these poor people, but he says they're teeming with entrepreneurs. When we think of the developing world, we don't think of entrepreneurs. We think entrepreneurs are in Silicon Valley. What makes entrepreneurship possible? Part of it is the institutions of justice. One man I interviewed said, ask yourself this question. Why are poor people poor? Are they somehow different from you? Are they somehow less capable than you are? Or is there something holding them back? Well, what's holding them back is they are excluded. So what do I mean by the institutions of justice? All right, I'm gonna give you four institutions of justice, all right? And I, I, again, I don't wanna go too long. I could go into it more detail in the Q&A if you'd like. But the first thing that poor people are excluded from is clear title to land. They are excluded from private property. In some countries, 60 to 70% of the land has no clear title. You don't know who owns it. Now, if you don't know who owns it, it can be taken away from you, especially if you're a widow or an orphan. Now, when you don't, ha when you don't have property, you have no view to build it up. Because if you spend all this energy building up and planting trees, and some rich man comes and steals it from you, you're to learn your lesson. Don't develop. Okay? And this is an area where Catholic social teaching and the Christian tradition has much to say. We see it in the Hebrew Bible, in the books of the New Testament. We see it in the fathers, the doctors. We see it in St. Thomas Aquinas, the importance of private property. It's, very, it's developed uh, in Rerum Navarum, in Leo XIII, and on and on. And one thing we see that's very important about private property is that it is always connected to the family. Private property creates the space for families to live out their freedom and their responsibility. So guess what? Private property is incredibly economically efficient. In those countries, I had it when my, in my PowerPoint, and I have, a, I have a map, it's very interesting, and it shows countries that have good private property protection and countries that don't. The countries that don't are poor, and the countries that do are generally wealthy. So property is essential for economic development, and most poor people throughout the developing world have very weak access to property, okay? But even if property weren't efficient, it would be extremely important because private property, as I said, creates the space for families to live out their freedom and their responsibility. And this is why socialists of all stripes, from Robert Owen to Engels to Adorno, you know, you name it, Gramsci, always see three primary obstacles to socialist reform. And they are religion, private property, and this present form of marriage. That's a quote. All right? Why? Because it's in private property where the family has space. And where do you think religion and culture is fundamentally passed down? In the homily? No offense, Peter. Your, your homilies are profound. But where is it prim primarily passed down? It's passed down in the family. So, the, so what, you, what we see is that private property is not just an economic question. It's a flourishing question. It's a culture question. It's a deep, important issue. And it's deeply part of the Jewish and Christian tradition, which I could go into more detail, from presupposed in the Decalogue um, to before that in Genesis 23, when Abraham is buying a plot of land for his wife Sarah, to on and on and on. Property is deeply affirmed because it creates space for the family, but it's also extremely important for justice and economic efficiency. And most poor people lack it. The second thing is justice in the courts. St. Thomas Aquinas, I think, is one of the first people to use the term rule of law, right? And these are two ways. One, access to justice. The Center for Research in India said, showed that it takes 20 years average, 20 years to get your court case heard. And if you're a widow and orphan, you're, you can't afford it. It's also a problem in registering a business. People are locked out of the free economy. They're locked out, I'm sort of sorry, of the formal economy. Hernando de Soto did a study. He set up two little sewing machine shops in Lima, just two. 
I mean, two little sewing machines in a shop in Lima. And he got four student lawyers to go around and do every single required registration in order to, set, in order to register the business formally. Okay? Four student lawyers. They couldn't take white big cars. They couldn't get their lawyer friends. Just like a poor person. You know how many days it took them? 289 days to register their business. Poor people are locked out. The other problem is free exchange. Now, we sometimes think free exchange, wait, doesn't competition hurt the poor? Here's why free exchange is important. When an economy becomes highly regulated, who do you think writes the regulations? Big businesses and powerful interest groups and entrenched bureaucrats. So the poorest of the poor lack the political, economic, and social context to navigate a bureaucracy dominated by these powerful interest groups. And again, all of these things, ladies and gentlemen, are, are part of our tradition. The scholastics have written on this, Aquinas on private property and other things. These are part of our tradition. And so I think one of the things we need to do is to go back into our tradition. So there's more I could say, um, but let me, um, let me make one last point before I conclude. There's a very well-known book called Why Nations Fail by Darren Osimoglu and, and James Robinson. Osimoglu, Osimoglu is a professor at MIT and Robinson's at Harvard. And they argue that those countries that succeed have what they call inclusive political and economic institutions. And those countries that fail have extractive, where the oligarchs pull out and steal from the people. And a lot of their stuff is, is actually, it's a very good book. There's a lot of truth in it. A lot of it is... Um, reworking the work of Douglas North, the, the Nobel laureate. But one serious weakness is they radically detach culture and institutions. They say, oh, culture is just what you eat, right, or what you wear. No, in fact, this is a deep, historically and sociologically naive position. Christopher Dawson says that cultus, religion, is the driving force of culture. And what we have to realize is that these institutions of justice did not emerge in the Enlightenment. They actually emerge out of Christian civilization. And so Christianity brings a whole host of things to the table when we think about dealing with poverty. But unfortunately, as I've said, we're too often mimicking humanitarianism. We bring not only this deep understanding of institutions of justice, in all its complexity and its relationship to the family and to human flourishing, we bring a deep understanding of the human being created in the image of God as a subject. And we bring an understanding of charity infused by, then charity understood as Christian love to seek the good of the other, to will the other person's good. And we bring it all ordained, oriented, was it ordained by reason, by logos, and oriented to the truth, most specifically the truth about man. Now, there's a place for us to reinvigorate the world of charity and development, to reinvigorate this whole understanding of how we engage the poor by going deep into our traditions and thinking it through. Good Christians are going to dis disagree. We're not gonna all have the same answer. But I think what we need to do is make life a lot more interesting by going back into our traditions and thinking through these problems like Christians instead of kind of like secularists. Now, fundamentally, ladies and gentlemen, there will always be poverty and there will always be suffering that will always require human love. Benedict XVI talks about this beautifully in Deus Caritas Est. There is no perfect situation that can be developed. There will always be pain. There will always be a need for us to care and help others. But I also think at the same time, it's deeply important to remember that for the majority of the world's poor, the problem is not one of charity or redistribution. The problem is one of justice and that the poor people are generally excluded from these institutions that would enable them to create prosperity for their own families 
and for their own communities. And so in conclusion, I think, as I said, to rethink the way we engage charity from first principles about what love is, what reason is, what truth is, and the nature and dignity of the human person. Thank you for your time. Michael, congratulations, you got a standing ovation. That's what I'm talking about. Are there any questions? I'll pay you later. Yeah. <laughs> um, just wondering, the pre like you gave kind of an overview of everything that... Um... Full stop. I gave an overview of everything. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm just kidding, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I'm, I guess what I'm left with is what are the practical solutions or mm. what are the practical things that me as a layperson, mother of two that has a part-time job and stays at home a lot of time, you know, right. what am I able to do to kind of... Mm. That's a good question. I mean, yeah. I think there's not a, a, a really satisfactory answer. I mean, I get this question a lot and there's really not a totally satisfactory answer because um, we're always looking for something to do, like a call to action. And part of this call to action is to think differently. That's the beginning. Um, but having said that, I think um, there's two things you can do. One is, fundamentally, if we think about caritas, charity, as human intersubjectivity, as relationships, then the place where you're going to be most effectively powerful is not in West Africa, but here, right, in the context of your own community, because you're engaged, you can have a relationship. That doesn't mean that we can't give our money and help in certain ways. And I would say in that sense, I think it takes um, some due diligence for us to really go and look, what are these, comp what are these uh, charities doing? How are they engaged? What's their attitude? How, get, show the way they report. Are they merely reporting on their efficiency but not telling us their deep social impact? Um, there's a whole host of things that can you know, be done that way. But I think the, the biggest thing is, to, is for, like, the way we can most deeply impact people in need is by being in relationship with them. And sometimes we want, I mean, I, 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 mean, I understand, we want to help those in, in Africa who are in dire need. But l let me say one thing. When we, when we, let's say, I'm not talking about a tornado or a tsunami or an earthquake or anything like that or a cholera breakout. I'm talking about normal kind of poverty in the developing world. How many of you have been to the developing world? Okay, a couple. When you first go there, right, and you see like a really poor person in a really like dirt road and everything like this, or you see it on television and it's just poor, it's an emergency for you and for me. It's not an emergency for them. They've been living this way chronically for generations. And so sometimes you know, they'd be like, oh my goodness, I gotta do something. One of the things I talk about is Tom's shoes, right? How many you know what Tom's shoes is? So you buy one pair of shoes, another pair gets sent over to the developing world. There's a lot of critique of Tom's because when you send shoes over to the developing world, you dis, you, you're competing with local manufacturers. But one of the things that happened is that he went down to Argentina, who's learned to play polo, and he saw all these people without shoes, and he's like, I gotta do something, right? That's admirable. I mean, it's awesome. I'm not saying like, you know, Tom, go home and drink beer. That's not what I'm saying. His name isn't actually Tom, but anyway, it's Blake. But anyway, but that's good that he did it. But one person I interviewed said, well, go and live in a country for a couple of years. Get to know the situation. And I think this goes back to the, my first point. Like, we sometimes think, hey, I'm a white American. I'm gonna go down to Africa and solve the problem. But we don't know what we're talking about, right? It's like, just because you went to Harvard and worked for an NGO doesn't mean you know anything about chicken farming, right? And I think that's why I think the deeper thing that we can do is, is look for the situation in our own, own community for relationships. Now, that doesn't, again, mean, I think, trying to find places that are doing good work and supporting them and investing in business, there's a whole host of things that can be done, but the practical one is right where you are. 
My standing ovation. He'll be next. Uh, you, you had mentioned that 70% um, of the money that supports Catholic relief services comes from the government, and so you raised the question, is it an arm of the church or an arm of the, of the state? Mm -hmm. um, and that's really kind of the go-to charity of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could give some examples of, because there's somebody a question that you asked uh, that is probably more the arm of the state than it is the arm of the church. Uh, could you give some examples of some of the uh, negative consequences of, of that kind of relationship or effect? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not an expert in the relationship of Catholic Relief Services, so there's a disease you know you can get from the podium. It's called expertitis, and like you can just get it. It's like very contagious. So I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't have a lot of. Like, I'm not an expert in Catholic Relief Services. I mean, I do know if you look up some of the situations, there have been some very serious problems where Catholic Relief Services is very close to provision of contraception and, and, and abortive services, right? And they say, well, they're not really doing it. But then you have kind of fungibility questions, and they're, they're very close where at least it's causing a scandal. Um, but I think the bigger, I think the the bigger thing that I would address with Catholic Relief Services, I mean, I, if you want, I can go into some of my research and, and give you some concrete examples. You can write me an email and I can get to get some of those things. But I think the bigger, deeper problem is that by Catholic Relief Services taking this relationship, they, they are, in, in a sense, part of this bigger poverty industry. And a couple of things can happen. One, they can become associated with U.S. foreign policy, right, which is, undermines the uh, authority. Benedict XVI has a powerful line. When the church becomes identified with political ideology, the result is always unbelief. So one, it's that. Two, if we think about Catholic Relief Services, I said the whole driving force of, of Catholic Relief Services should be caritas, that is Christian love and human flourishing, which includes living out the gospel. What basically the Catholic, Catholic Relief Services is become what Francis says, another NGO, right? And I think those are the deeper kind of attitudinal, philosophical appropriation of, of, of dominant humanitarianism. And most of the people, Catholic Relief Services generally has kind of a reputation of kind of supporting the same traditional top-down humanitarian social engineering that's been going on uh, for years. Um, and I think that's the, the question. The other thing is, and this is a, a little bit more of a, this is a little bit more of a, um, an attitudinal problem. When, when, you, work, when you work for a go, uh, an agency that's getting government money, that government money comes with lots of strings. Okay, lots. And it does two things. It has um, an enervating effect. Okay, I used to work at a Catholic in, a university. And we say, oh, we can't do that because it's a violation of church and state. Like, well, no, you absolutely can do that, right? So what it does is it creates this frozen thing of what we think we can do. But the other thing it does is that it actually has real deep consequences on the, on the moral life. So, for example, with this whole rising issue of, of gender theory and all these other things and red, redefinition of marriage and all these other these deep kind of issues, how how is Catholic Relief Services going to be independent from government uh, influence when they're taking seventy when seventy percent of their budget is there? And so I think you know I don't want to go into all the specifics there, but but I think if you look at how the church and other schools are having to deal with the fact that they're taking government money and how it's reducing their independence and reducing their capacity to preach the gospel, so to Catholic Relief Services is having this on a, on a massive scale. And so the question I have is about um, what are your thoughts on crowd-powered microloans? And so maybe for people that, that don't know what those are, it's similar to how Airbnb has maybe democratized housing and Uber has democratized transportation, there are companies out there that do microloans to third world countries that come from, I guess, normal people who just like want Kiva, to invest. Right? Mm -hmm. like There's Kiva. several. Yeah. Pinka, 
do you find those useful or do you find those um, opposed to prudence? No, I mean, I think a couple, a couple of things. I mean, micro, microfinance and microcredit is a very interesting area. It's a very complex area. I did a uh, number of interviews with, with people who, who are involved in it, Africans and another man named Damien von Stauffenberg, who, who at the time ran a company called MicroRate, which would evaluate these um, institutions. And if you, if you look kind of micro microfinance, those are the three things. Number one, I mean, I think it's, it's a very interesting area. There's some research that says that it's, that it tends to be in the long term not as helpful. There's other research that, that shows that it helps people get from po abject poverty to poverty, right? And that, and that it gives them certain, especially when it's combined with micro savings, micro insurance, um, and then it can create uh, a lot of opportunities for networks. I think one of the strengths of micro loans um, is that microfinance, for example, the way the Grameen Bank and others have kind of done it, is they usually tend to borrow in groups. And by borrowing in groups, it has a certain kind of subsidiarity uh, force to it that creates networks and of help so that people can kind of grow together, which is very important because, you know, the, the associationalism it has, is a, and civil society is a, has a deep uh, place in, in helping economic development in the long run. Um, Microfinance can be a, a problem if it's only really about loans and not also about training and credit and micro insurance. Um, but it's a very powerful thing because you have, I mean, like people have written on the bottom of the pyramid, what's his name, Pralhad, and all these other people writing on the bottom of the pyramid. There, there are these, I mean, there are hundreds of millions of people, billions of people really, who, who are kind of locked out on what you're what you're having is a micro market micro capitalism if you want to call it i don't like the word capitalism because it's kind of a marxist word but but you have this this kind of infusion there and it gives people opportunities to get access to credit that they normally wouldn't get now let me say to people who understand micro loans sometimes are at 48 50 percent interest rates which sounds like unbelievably high and it is unbelievably high because your risk levels are high but compared to say a loan shark where it's 90 percent and impossible to pay back Microcredit has almost, a, like the Grameen Bank and some of these other places have 97% rate repay back rates. The biggest problem is when microfinance becomes like a consumer credit card uh, where it's used for purchasing things. And in there, it's an ad absolute disaster. And so that's why there are a lot of microfinance, like Muhammad Yunus, Damien von Stauffenberg, a lot of other people talk about there are good microfinance organizations and bad microfinance organizations. And part of it really is the ones that are the best operate like a merchant bank, right? If you understand what I mean by, by that, they're like in the community, engage with the person when they're making a loan, they're making sure that this loan has potential for cap, you know, for, for business success and repayment so that you can repay and make more money than you're going to repay. And so it's really, again, a merchant bank relationship of two people seeking after uh, the, the, the good of that, of that person and the family. When it's not that way, it, it becomes a problem. And there's a, a recent paper that if you write me, I'll, I'll send it to you, that some, one of my colleagues just wrote that's a deep critique of it. And, and I, I, I haven't studied it in depth yet. One last question, Michael. Um, hi. Hello. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, it's a different situation. How would you, would you see the, the practice of uh, prudential charity in the case of uh, the refugees, uh, the millions of refugees that are fleeing from Islamic countries into Europe? Uh, what would be the, the possibility there for helping? Yeah. I, you know what? I, I have, that's a, again, that's a deeply complex issue. I haven't really studied it in, in depth enough. To give anything, to give any satisfactory answer that I would be satisfied. I mean, I don't, you might be satisfied, but I wouldn't be satisfied uh, with the answer. I mean, I think there's a lot of things uh, going on. I do think sentimentality is the wrong attitude. Uh, I can say that. I think that there's a lot of it is sentimental, and I think a lot of it is not thinking about the potential negatives uh, for sure. But anything beyond that, um, I have like my own kind of personal. The, the, like developing ideas, but I haven't studied enough to speak about it with any authority whatsoever. 
Be done. Thanks.